It'll be on the website. So much technology today. It's ridiculous. Let's turn in our Bibles. And adults, I hope you've all got your Bibles. If you've got your own, your own Bibles, if you haven't, there's some at the back there that you can uh, borrow. Uh, if, you, uh, if you want to get a new Bible, if you, want, if you haven't got one, come and see me and I'll give you some advice and, and, and show you some links. Uh, I, I get a lot of savings from some um, Christian books, bookshop, so I'm, I can get you a good deal uh, on that. Let's turn our Bibles. We're in John chapter 11, uh, and we've been going through John chapter 11, and we've seen uh, that this chapter is about the death of Lazarus. And we've been building up to the actual resurrection of Lazarus as we've gone through the weeks. We looked at the death of Lazarus, how Jesus was notified by a messenger sent by Martha that Lazarus was ill. But by the time the messenger, two days later, uh, got to Jesus, Jesus already knew that Lazarus had died. And that's what he told his, his disciples. But his disciples didn't understand what he was talking about. They thought on the spiritual side, they thought that he was asleep. And if, if he was asleep, then that would do him good. If you're ill, go to sleep. That's, 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 a good, uh, uh, that's a good thing to do. If you're ill, go to sleep. You'll feel better when you wake up. Uh, but that's what they thought. And then he had to explain it to them in detail. He said, he said Lazarus is dead. And he says, I'm, I'm glad that you weren't there. So that you can, can see the glory of God and the glory that he will give me. When they finally go to, uh, to, uh, to Mary Martha's house and to Lazarus's tomb and they raise him from their dead which is what we come into but we remember that Jesus wept when he came to just outside of Bethany and Martha being a busy Martha uh, every church needs a Martha we know that uh, Martha went out to meet him and to talk to him and he says there in verse 32, Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in the spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, Where have you laid him? And they said, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. Jesus weeps for everybody, for all those who are lost in sin, and in darkness, those who are spiritually dead. This is what he was talking about. They said to him, Lord, come and see him. Jesus wept. So the, Jesus, so the Jews said, see how he loved him. Well, some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? And then our verses this morning, uh, verse 38 down to 44, it says there, then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. And it was a cave and a stone lay against it. And Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odour, for he has been dead four days. I like the King James Version. <laughs> he stinketh. Gets that across a lot better. No, uh, not so, Lord, for he stinketh. Verse 41. Uh, <laughs> hey, verse 40. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone and Jesus lifted up his eyes and he said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. So I knew that you would always hear me. But I said this on account of the people standing around that they may believe that you sent me. When, they had said the, when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. What a blessed, what a wonderful word. We start in verse 38. Jesus is, is now uh, in Bethany. He's travelled there. And he says there in verse 38, when Jesus was deeply moved, and, and the Greek comes across a lot uh, stronger, it means he was indignant even. He was greatly moved because of the loss of someone he loved, but he was also indignant at the Jews who were there, who, who were just uh, professional whalers. They, they, they'd come along just because somebody had died. And he was indignant at them also uh, because... Uh, he was indignant at Mary and Martha because he had told them time and time again 
what, who he was and what he could do. And they were still stuck in the physical world. Just like the people in this world today. We can tell them about Jesus Christ and the miracles that he can do. And the salvation that they can have. How they can be raised from the dead. As they're spirit given spiritual life. Live forever with God. Uh, yet they can't get out of the physical world. That's the trouble that they have. He was deeply moved when he came to the tomb. This is the last time in the Gospel of John that Christ is going to give people a demonstration, a sign of his resurrection. The resurrection of Lazarus perfectly mirrors the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If we just jump over to Mark chapter 8 and verse 12, we will see something that he says there. Mark chapter 8 and verse 12. Matthew, Mark. That's for me, not for you. Matthew, Mark chapter 8 and verse 12. Uh, I love to hear that it's flicking of pages and the swiping of iPads. But <laughs> Stephen, he doesn't count if you do it like that. That's, that doesn't count. Acts chapter 8, verse 12. And he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, Why does this generation seek a sign? Why do, why do people want to see before they will believe? How many times do we do things without seeing the proof who drives their car across a bridge without understanding how the bridge was built who sits on a chair without knowing if the chair is fixed there's chairs next door that are broken well people will sit on them not give it a second thought how many people cross the road in faith that the traffic lights will stop the cars but people coming to christ they want to sign why does this generation seek a sign it's because they are spiritually blind they cannot see they're in darkness. He says, Truly I say unto you, no sign will be given to this generation. That's what he said in Mark. Well, look what he said in Matthew earlier on. Matthew chapter 12. We're not going to flick through many passages this morning. To... Well, we might. I don't know. We'll see when we get there. Matthew chapter 12, verses 39. Matthew chapter 12, verses 39. Um, let's go down to verse, uh, <clears throat> verse 40, 41. Matthew chapter 29. Matthew chapter 12, verses 39 to 41. But he answered them, he answered the scribes and the Pharisees, an evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given them, given to it, except, now he says, the sign of the prophet Jonah. We all remember Jonah, the story of Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, not the whale, the fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And then look what he says. The men of Nineveh, will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they, the evil people of Nineveh, who Jonah didn't want to preach to, that's how much he hated them, because that's how evil they were, they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. This is a sign that he's going to give us through the raising of Lazarus to show what he is going to do very shortly at his own, his own death and resurrection. He came to the tomb and it was a cave and a stone lay against it, just like his own grave. And Jesus said, take away the stone. Take away the stone. That was his commandment. He could have done that himself. He could have lifted that stone. He could have made it disappear. He could have whatever. Man, uh, when man could have couldn't take away the stone, uh, when Christ was raised, an angel cast the stone away. But here he's telling man to do it. And the fact that Jesus could have removed the stone with just a word and with just the commandment for them to remove the stone shows that God does not ordinarily do what man can do himself. Why? Is God giving us his word, his Holy Spirit in our hearts 
if he was to go, if he, he was to come down and preach the gospel message who's supposed to do that we are his messengers we are his envoys we are the ones who to lift the stone off the tombs of those who are who are dead spiritually so that they can be raised to new life Martha says, uh, Martha, the sister of the dead man, Lazarus, has said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odour, for he has been dead four days. Dead four days. His spirit had left him, according to Jewish tradition. They believe that if when somebody died for three days, their spirit hung around, hoping and waiting that their body would be, uh, would be resuscitated. But after three days, the spirit was gone into Abraham's bosom or, in, or into Tartarus or, or Gehenna uh, and, and would not come back, wouldn't come back. So the Jews knew for, in, for definite, in their own tradition, this is what Jesus is addressing, in their own idea, in their own minds, that Lazarus was definitely physically, spiritually dead. We need to understand that completely and utterly. There was no chance that he could just have uh, been resuscitated. Dead four days. Not so, Lord, for he stinketh. That's how sure they were. They didn't have time to embalm him. They just laid him in the grave. And four days later, uh, he, was, he was rotting. He had, he had gone. Uh, 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 he had seen. He, he would, uh, God says Jesus will never see corruption. He had, Lazarus is seen corruption. He is corrupted. His body is deteriorating. Christ will never see that. We will never see that. Our bodies will corrupt in the grave, but our spirits will live on for eternity. As I've often said, if you're a saved person in this church today, there's no middle age. There's no old age. Because from the moment you are saved, you have eternal life. You will live forever. At what point through eternal life will you be middle age or old age? There won't. It will be the same for eternity. What a wonderful, what a wonderful thing to know. But to open this grave risked uh, ritual defilement. It was a, no, this was not a thing that was done. Ritual defilement. You would be unclean for seven days, and you have to go back to the priests and make make an offering. It was a defilement to see the physical corruption of the body, to touch a dead body. The Jews wouldn't do that. That's why when we read the story about the Good Samaritan, one of the reasons, and not the reason, but one of the reasons, perhaps the Levites and the priests went past uh, the, 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 Samarit, the man who was injured was because they didn't want to be ritually unclean. Their tradition got in the way. Their religion got in the way of them helping somebody. That's what we're to, to avoid. You know, those doors, those church doors, are, are open for a reason, to let anybody in the church who needs to hear the word of God. Where am I? Chapter, verse, verse 40. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? Can you imagine Jesus saying this to you? You come to Jesus for salvation, and he will say to you, I will t uh, Did I not tell you that if you believe, if you believe in Christ, if you believe what the scriptures say, if you believe what this man, Bible John in the street, if you believe what he's saying to you, you will see the glory of God. You will see it in your life. You will see it in your heart, in your spirit. You will see it all around you. You will see it when you pray and people are healed. People are brought to salvation. But he's saying to Martha, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? Did I not tell you? Look back at verse 25 and 20, 25 to 27. He said, Jesus said unto her, when Martha had gone out to see him, see him Jesus said unto her, I am that great Jehovah expression. I am. That was his name, not a description. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. You will die physically, but spiritually you will live on. And everyone who lives and believes in me, he says, shall never die. Then he asks her this question. As he asks everybody 
who, that he comes to. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? And she said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who is coming into this world. She believed him. He was the glory of God. Look at Romans chapter 6 and verse 4. The wonderful book of Romans written by Paul, carried to Rome by Phoebe in her skirts. Romans chapter 6 verse 4. He's just coming. Romans, chapter, Romans is a great book. When you get to chapter 8, uh, from chapter 1 to chapter 7, it's downhill. He's damning everybody. He's cursing everybody everybody is going to hell and damnation you're all the same you're all sinners and then from the end of chapter six chapter seven chapter eight he tells you of the holy spirit and the chance you have a salvation but look at chapter six verse four he says we were buried therefore with him in by baptism into death we are buried with him if we believe in christ we want to live eternal life we must be buried with him. That's the old man, that's the sinful man that was there before. We are buried with him into death in order that just as Jesus was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. But look at that verse right there in the middle. Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father and for one reason only, that we too might walk in newness of life. No other reason did this happen. It wasn't to wow people. It wasn't a, a demonstration of, of God's uh, uh, ability. It was so that we might walk in the newness of life. And it was to God's glory. You will see the glory of God revealed in me, he's saying. But first you must believe. Then you will see. The Jews always needed a sign before they would believe. No. Jesus turned that over. You must believe before you will see. Faith and belief are very important. Look at verse 41. Verse 41 says, So they took away the stone. <clears throat> so they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. Father, thank you that you have heard me. He lifted up his eyes. Look at chapter 17 and verse 1 of the Gospel of John. Chapter 17 and verse 1. So when Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. This is what he's saying. This is a picture of what is happening right here in chapter 17 and carries on and he looked up to his father father i thank you that you have heard me why is jesus thanking his own father that he has heard me that he has heard him god always hears us he hears our prayers he hears our, our cries for help our pleas our pains our anger have you ever been angry at god what, God, why have you done this? He listens to you. He understands. He doesn't throw it back in your face. Remember the centurion. I always forget his name. That Peter witnessed it. Who? Cornelius. Cornelius, yes, you remember. Cornelius. Remember Cornelius who Peter went and witnessed to? He prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. And finally an angel appeared to him and said, Cornelius, your prayers have come up to God as a memorial. Now they will be answered. So many times we pray to God and our prayers are not answered and we pray over and over and over and over again. And we get angry, God, why have you answered our prayers? Because it's not time yet. It's not time. There will be a time. And it may not be the, the answer you're looking for. But he will answer that prayer. Look what he says here. Father, I thank you that you have heard me. What a blessing to be able to come before our almighty God. When Jesus died upon that cross, there was an earthquake. The temple, uh, uh, the big veil in the temple was rent. The Ark of the Covenant was seen by everybody and we had access, free access to God. 
from that day on. We don't need to go to a priest. You don't need to come to a pastor. You don't need to go to a booth and, and, and confess your sins. You don't even need to close your eyes and fold your hands. That's just something we do. The Jews prayed with their arms, with their hands open, hoping to receive something. We pray with our hands closed. Some people pray on their knees. Some people pray prostrate on the floor. Some people pray standing. It doesn't matter. Some people pray while they're driving. God will always listen. Some people just speak to God as if they're speaking to a friend or a companion. But remember who he, who he is. Father, I thank you that you've heard me. Thank God that he hears us. It says in verse 42, and this is why he thanks God that he's heard him. He says, I knew that you always hear me. Jesus says, I know that you will always hear me. But I said this on account of the people standing around that they may believe that you sent me. All of this what, that he is doing, that he is saying, is a sign to these Jews who are standing around watching him, watching what is happening. It's a sign to them. Jesus knew, look, look at, the, the, at the sentence structure. I knew that you always, not heard or listened, but you always hear me. You always, in the past, now and in the future, you will always hear me. Christ is at the right hand of God interceding on our behalf. Who do you think is listening to him when you sin and you ask for forgiveness and pleading to God? I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around that they may believe that you sent me. Do you know, we can do exactly the same. I've been asked like before, how, how do I start witnessing to people? Well, just, uh, I find it very hard just to even say something. No, that's a, that's a struggle for people. That's, that's fine. New Christians will struggle with this. People who have never stretched themselves out like that will struggle with this. Just say, isn't it, someone says, isn't it a glorious day? It says, God has made such a wonderful day. Pray in public. Pray over your food. Say grace when you're in a restaurant. You'll be surprised at the people that come to you. You'll be surprised at the people that will look at you. I sat in Starbucks with somebody else. We got our Bibles out to, uh, to look at something that we were talking about. And there were tables empty around us. And everybody was watching. But that's the thing. People saw the evidence. They saw the sign. And they knew that something was going on. These Jews knew something special was happening. This was Jesus. This was the Messiah. Look what they said before. Well, some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man, they'd already seen his miracles, also have kept this man from dying? So now they're looking and they're expecting to see what he's going to do. Could he not have stopped him from dying? So what's he going to do now? This is what he's going to do. He's going to pray to God. Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you will always hear me. Well, I said this on account of the people standing around. I said this. I think it's, this is what he's talking about, what he's about to say. That they may believe that you sent me. Look at verse 43. This is the wonderful part. When he had said these things, when he had prayed to God, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. Sorry, King James. Lazarus, come out. Lazarus, come out of the grave. Why could Lazarus come out of the grave? Did Jesus take the stone away? No, his family took the stone away. People took the stone away. People did something first. They went and they found his body. They opened the grave. They revealed the light of Christ into the dark of that tomb so that dead person would be in the light reveal the light to people the eternal light of God show them preach to them witness to them if they don't like it they can stay dead you know be like a bumblebee there's no nectar in this flower buzz off to another flower preach the gospel to people witness to them tell them of the Messiah and you know on occasion some people will come and they will want to know how do 
how do how do I get saved? I, I don't I, I don't I don't want to go to hell. You know, I want to know more. What 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 is this about? Their ears will be pricked, and their hearts will be opened. And this is what will happen. They will come out of that grave because they will hear the word of Christ. Lazarus, come out. Jean, come out. Susie, come out. Tony, come out. They all heard that at one time. At the point of their salvation. And they came out of the darkness. They came out of sin. Into the light of eternal life. And they were saved. Now they live in that light for eternity. What a wonderful blessing. Lazarus, come out. Look what happened. The man who had died, the man who was physically, spiritually dead for four days, he came out. That's a miracle. Salvation is a miracle. Salvation is God reaching down into this earth and plucking some fruit and taking it, holding it in his hand. That's where you are. You're in his hand. You're in the hand of Christ. No man shall what snatch me out of his hand i and my father are one you never lose that salvation it's there in the, in their hands and he came out of the tomb the man who had died came out but there's another miracle that happens here that we often miss and just skip over he says his hands and feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. His feet were bound. His hands were bound. His face was wrapped with a cloth. He had, this is, this is the sinner. He has chains that are holding his hands, that are holding his feet and taking him where he doesn't want to go, holding him down from reaching the Lord, turning him back into the darkness, the cloth over his face, Blinding him from the truth that's before him. Deafening him from the word of God. And he's come out. He, he didn't waddle out. I don't know whether he floated out, whether he, he, he mm, just, hum, you know, I don't know. He just says that he came out with his hands and his feet bound in a cloth over his face. And what did Jesus say to them? Now he's, he's resurrected him. He's alive. He told them to take the stone away from the tomb before he could do that as a sign. Now he tells them to do something else. What does he, does he tell them to do? Unbind him and let him go. Unbind him. Do you know we get, Christ, we get people come into the church who are not saved, they get saved, especially the children, that's wonderful. Adults as well, or people who come from, from other places, from other churches, you know, and other, other, other situations. You know, and, and they've still got this luggage, they're, they're still bound to an old sin, or they're, they're still where something's holding them down. And what are we to do? The body of Christ, Ebenezer Baptist Church, this isn't Ebenezer Baptist, this is building. Glorious building, it costs a lot of money to keep up, but glorious building. A lot of work, John, eh? Ah, Catholic Mark. <laughs> a lot of work, Catholic Mark, eh? Or is it Bandit Mark? We need to find a new nickname for you now, don't we? Painting Mark, yeah. Just like that. But what do we now do with that new Christian? Well, that person who has come out of the darkness of sin and death, what do we do? We unbind them from the traditions, from the lies, from the philosophies of man that they've clung to before they came to salvation. They've seen the light, they've saved, they know the Messiah. But they need to learn and to grow. Remember Priscilla and Aquila in Ephesus. When they met Apollos, Apollos was preaching. He was preaching the Messiah resurrected. He was preaching about, the, about Christ. But he wasn't preaching about the Son of God. He was preaching about the Jewish Messiah. And Aquila and Priscilla had to explain it to him in a, be in a better way. They had to teach him. 
had to edify him. They had to disciple him. That's what we do. We bring people in, we disciple them in teen Sunday school class, in the Sunday school class, in the church, Wednesday night prayer nights. Don't forget, back in September, our Bible study is going to restart in September uh, on, on a Thursday night. If you've never done a Bible a school with us, come along. It's, it's fantastic. But anyway, but that's the important thing to do. Go to them. Remove the stone that is blocking them from the light of Christ. Then let Christ do his work of salvation. And then lead them into the church so that they can grow. Let's bow our heads in prayer. <coughs>